have your Bibles with you this morning, open them with me to Luke chapter 5. This morning is week number 5 of our series entitled Breakthrough. And every week we're building one upon another, talking about how to experience transformation and change in areas of our life that seem to be immovable and improbable that they're ever going to change and they're ever going to shift. You know, all of us have different obstacles, mountains, giants in our life that we either are fighting against or we've given up, but they're, they're, they're there nonetheless. We all have areas in our life where we're called to grow and we're called to change and we're called to break through. And the good news this morning is that we serve a God who is a God of breakthrough. The difficulty for us sometimes is we don't know how to break through. We know the thing we want to break through, and we know that we should break through. We don't always know how to break through. And this morning, we're going to be talking about the point of breakthrough, where breakthrough really begins. Where's that tipping point where things begin to shift in our favor, momentum that turns into breakthrough? So look with me here, beginning in verse number 17 of Luke chapter 5. It says, now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town in Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought a, on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, They went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said to them, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies, who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and he said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins? He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And immediately he rose up before them, took up what what he had been lying on, and he departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and they were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. We have seen strange things here today. What's interesting to me is that the response of the crowd to Jesus doing what was normal to him was they called normal in the kingdom of God something that was strange. Because miracles and breaking points and change And supernatural type of things in our world are described as strange. When I read that last verse where they said that we have seen strange things here today, it reminded me of the show that Jane and I are binging season two on right now. We have been seeing stranger things. They saw strange things. We're seeing stranger things. And we're in season two right now. How many of you have seen any of strange or things. Anybody? Okay. A few of you have watched it. We, we binged, completely binged season one, and then we've been waiting around for season two, and now I'm on like episode five. So if you don't know what Stranger Things is, it's this uh, Netflix original series that was, uh, it's a story of four friends who grew up in the 1980s in a small Midwest town who were just going to school, doing life in middle school, high school, And strange supernatural things begin to happen in their town that they don't know how to describe and don't know how to respond to. In fact, many of the people in the town have no idea what's going on, but one of their friends goes missing in season one, and it's all about them trying to find their friend and in the process confront all of these kind of supernatural elements that are breaking into their town. There's this whole realm that they discover called the Upside Down, and it's got some monsters and all kinds of different elements in it. And it's the story of, of tracking down, finding, and rescuing their friend from the upside down in the midst of some strange occurrences. Now, I don't like this show because it's the greatest scientific, you know, great, greatest uh, computer-generated 
uh, artistry or any of those kinds of things. I love it because it's set in the 1980s, <laughs> which is the greatest decade that the world has ever seen. If you, if you, if you are under 30 years old, I know, I know you think you, it's not, but you missed it because it was totally rad. It was tubular, man. It was like, gag me with a spoon. It was, and so I don't know whether the show is called Stranger Things because the fashion is stranger or because of the supernatural element, but I tell you, I love it because it's nostalgic. I mean, they're, everything in the, in the show is set in the 80s and they're meticulous about it. Like the phone that is actually hung on a wall and you had to like hold it and it had a cable connected to it. Imagine that. Um, they, uh, they wore corduroy jackets, Levi jackets with fur collars that are now back in style. I actually bought one last year after I watched the show. I, it's the second one I've had. I had it the first time when it came out in the 80s. Now I got it back again. And you, here's the official definition of old. You know your old school when things that were in when you were a kid then go out of style and then come back in style. I have a pair of Vans tennis shoes that I had the exact shoes in the 1980s. And now I have them again, except now on the back of the sole it has a tag that says old school Vans. <laughs> That's the manufacturer's way of saying, if you bought these and you had them the first time, you're old. <laughs> Feathered hair, Jordache jeans, Bugle Boy, Nike Cortez, Schwinn Stingray bikes. Come on, somebody. Reliant K cars. I mean, all of the elements of the 1980s. I, I love it. And so as I watch it, I'm reliving my childhood in many ways. But it got me thinking that the story of Stranger Things is very similar to the story that we, that we just read about a paralyzed man who had some friends who were willing to go above and beyond the normal to put him into proximity to Jesus in order to be rescued and to be healed. You see, in the, in the show, Stranger Things, there's four friends who are unwilling to let Stranger Things keep them away uh, from finding and rescuing their friend. And in this story, there are some friends. It doesn't tell us how many of them, but they're friends of a paralyzed man, and they are unwilling to accept his condition as the best it's ever going to be, all he's going to get, status quo, just deal with it. They find out that Jesus is in town. And so whether it was their paralyzed friend who initiated it or whether it was the friends who picked him up and said, we're taking you, it doesn't matter. Together, they all made a plan to take their friend and to bring them to where Jesus was, you see, because they had heard about this Jesus, that Jesus changed things, that Jesus was confronted with sick people and made them well, that Jesus was confronted with people that were demonically possessed and he set them free. He was confronted even with death itself and reversed it. He was confronted with lack and he overpowered it. And so now Jesus has come to their town and so they said, let's, let's load up our friend and let's, let's take him there. And I, I tend to think it was the paralyzed man, actually, who even though he's immobilized, says to his friends, take me to Jesus. And his friends partnered with him and said, we're gonna, we're gonna do whatever we gotta do to get you into the proximity of Jesus. And you know, this story not only relates to Stranger Things, the show, but it, I think it relates to each and every one of us in, in the different places of our life, at the different times and the different seasons of our life. And when it seems like the things that we want to change aren't changing. When it seems like the things we, we hope will shift aren't shifting. When, whether we know it or not, we're, we're, we're butting up against a wall, a barrier. And, and we want to move beyond the limitations of where we are at. We want to move beyond kind of the funk that maybe we found ourselves in, but, it, but we're paralyzed. We're paralyzed. We're immobile. You see, you can physically be paralyzed and be mobile and active in your faith. Or you can be paralyzed in your faith and in your mentality, but yet physically active and alive. 
I think being paralyzed spiritually is a worse fate than being physically paralyzed. See, paralysis physically happens to us when there's been a trauma, where there's been an accident, where there's been something that has happened to us that stopped the central nervous system from communicating to our body the messages of mobility that it needs. And so our brain is telling our body what to do, but the rest of the body can't respond because the lines of communication have been broken off. There's a paralysis, there's a disease. And spiritual paralysis oftentimes happens in our life. We stop moving in faith, we stop moving in the direction of Jesus, we stop moving in purpose, we stop moving in positivity because something has happened to us. A trauma, a trauma in our marriage, a trauma in our faith, a trauma in our hope and our perspective. Once upon a time we used to be pursuing dreams and goals and we were growing and, and we had hopes and things before us and we had a, a framework and a grid by which to view life. We saw God as good and we saw ourselves with the world before us with lots of opportunity but trauma comes along. Sometimes it's trauma because of our own decisions and sometimes it's things that other people have done to us that have injured us. Or sometimes it's because of situations that we're in and we just find ourselves on a stretcher of life, our soul just laid out with the inability to move. And it's in that point that the enemy loves to whisper in our ear, things are never going to change. This is as good as it gets. Just settle. Status quo. And in those moments, it can seem very, very hopeless. But the tipping point of faith what you see all throughout the pages of scripture and what you see in this story is when somebody who finds themselves in that situation chooses to do the most difficult part of breaking through that there is. They take the first step in the direction of breakthrough. The first step, their faith becomes active and they choose to do what seems illogical and irrational to do. They begin to take the first step. This man gets his friends together and he says, take me to Jesus. That's the first step. That's his offensive act. Offense can be active. It can, it can be like a football team that is offensively has the ball and is moving it down the field. Or offense, an offensive move can be something that actually offends our thinking. But regardless of how you want to interpret it, the tipping point or the point of breakthrough happens when our faith goes from being just ethereal and an intellectual ascent of what we think we're supposed to say, and it actually becomes a conviction in our heart that causes us to move. That's the tipping point of change. It's faith. It's active faith. You see, a lot of people will say, well, I believe, and they can list off what they think they, or what they claim to believe. I believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, born of a virgin. And we can list off our creeds and we can declare our statement of faith. But sometimes our belief system can just be what we know we're supposed to believe here. But I, I will tell you, what you really believe is actually lived out consciously and subconsciously through your actions. Because it's possible to be in the church and say, I believe in God, but yet Monday through Saturday, you live like a practical atheist. It's possible for you to say, I believe God's good, but every reaction you take in your life is a defensive response because you become convinced that if anything good is ever going to happen in your life, you're going to make it happen because you can't trust God. And it may not just be Godward. It may be in the people that are around you. I don't believe that my spouse is trustworthy. And so you live your life constantly in the state of suspicion. And the idea of trying to trust and believe in them, taking that first step is the most difficult step. Taking that first step as a business person to trust, once again, is the most difficult step. But if we'll take the first step the most difficult step, that's the point where breakthrough begins to shift, where momentum begins to shift. It's the most difficult step. It's the first step that becomes the point of breakthrough. Jane and I enjoy running, and well, maybe I should refine. We run, <laughs> and sometimes we enjoy it. Sometimes we're like in this uh, you know, season where we're just running, all, we run four or five days a week and it's just easy and you're in that routine. 
And then you get into these times where you're just busy or you don't feel good or it starts getting cold out or it's darker in the morning where I don't want to run. So I wake up and I, I, I talk myself out of it. Can anybody relate to this? Or it's like you wake up and you're just like, man, I, I, should, I should run. And there's actually times where I, I put my clothes on and then I sit down and I think about running. Look at my watch and it's like, oh, okay. Five minutes, I'll go in five minutes. And then I talk myself out of it. And I'll just do it tomorrow. You know, tomorrow's a better day than today. I'll, I'll, I need a rest day, I'm a little tired. I should really go study or, um, yeah, it's a little dark out, so is it raining, threat of rain? Okay, I probably shouldn't rain, I don't wanna get. So you talk yourself out of it. But once you get out there, do you know the most difficult step is the first step you take to, with intention to go and do something? It's called a step of faith. And all throughout the Bible, what we realize is that God is a God of breakthrough. Stranger things are actually normal to him. Strange things, kingdom things, healing, miracles are normal to God. The things that you and I read about in the Bible that are supernatural are hard to believe and hard to understand sometimes because we're viewing them through our five dimension or our three dimensions and our five senses in our own intellect. And we, we try and perceive God, who's the creator of the heavens and the earth, who doesn't operate on three dimensions. He can create as many dimensions as he wants to, probably operates on a billion dimensions all at once. He's outside of time. He makes things that don't exist. He can alter them at his will. And we try and read them through the lens of our little finite West Michigan mind. And we try and say, God, I'll believe you and trust you when I can understand you. And it's like a, it's like a, uh, a calculus major flipping his textbook in front of an infant and saying, that's truth, read it, it'll answer all of your questions. And, it's, and we're on the other end of that saying, God, I'll, I'll trust you and believe you when I can understand you. Can I just promise you, God is not finite like you are. You're not going to understand everything. And what you think is difficult and challenging, God calls normal. But here's what I know is that every time God does help and brings a breakthrough in the, in the stories of Scripture. We have a tendency to emphasize the miraculous, supernatural part of things. But those are always in response to humans, man or woman, taking the first step, the offensive step, the initiative, the active faith, in doing what seems to be impossible. Think about this, Jesus heals the man with a withered hand, right? What does he say to him? Stretch out your hand. Well, Jesus, if I could stretch out my hand, I wouldn't be asking you to heal me. No, just stretch it out. You move, God moves. The man who's laying on the cot, rise up, take up your bed. Well, if I could take up my bed, I wouldn't be lying on it. Well, just stand up. See, a lot of times we lay on the beds of our situations and we say, God, I want to feel something and know something 100% before I respond to it. And God says, well, you'll know it 100% once you've done it. We want him to move and then we'll move. But God says, no, you move and I'll move. He tells Moses, stretch out your staff over the Red Sea. I'm going to part the Red Sea. It's impossible. Just do it. He moves, God moves. Jesus feeds a, 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 a multitude. He tells the disciples, guys, feed the multitudes. Well, Jesus, we would if it would take 200 denarii for us to feed all of these people. That's three quarters of a year's salary. In southwest Michigan, that would mean it would cost $30,000 to feed all those people. And so they complained to Jesus, Jesus, we don't have money. Jimmy John's is freaky fast, but it ain't freaky cheap. How are we paying for this? How are we paying for this? Jesus says, tell them to sit down in groups and bring me what you got. What do I have? All we've got is this kid's Lunchable. It's got a couple sardines and crackers in there. Bring them here to me. First step. Here you go. Jesus says, watch this. Miracle, miracle, miracle. Bam, 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 bam. Jesus says, part the Red Sea. I don't know how. Put your stick over it. No, there's no power in the stick. There's power in the act. The first step. So faith-filled obedience is the tipping point. It's the tipping point 
where breakthrough begins. This, the tipping point, the, the act of faith for this young man or this older man who's a paralytic was actually going from the state of being paralyzed and in his home to actually going in pursuit of the answer in the presence of the Lord. It was his tipping point. A tipping point, by the way, is defined this way by the dictionary. It's a critical point in an evolving situation that leads to a new and an irreversible development. It's, it's something that shifts. It's something that changes. It's a critical point in a fluid situation that begins to shift the weight in your favor and creates irreversible momentum, but it starts with a point. And that point is when we move in faith-filled obedience to God's word and to God's promises and God's promptings that the wind of God's supernatural, miraculous breakthrough power begins to catch the sails of our life and begins to move us in the direction that he's calling us into. See, this young man, he, he goes to where Jesus was, but it's interesting to me that when he shows up, where you would think, okay, I'm doing everything that you're telling me to do, Jesus. All right, you're telling me to take the first step? I take the first step. Guys, would you all pick me up and carry me to where Jesus is at? So they do that, and he's, he's gotta be thinking to himself, wow, this is awesome. I'm stepping out in faith. I'm doing what God's called me to do. You get to the house where Jesus is at, and look what it says. It says, and when they, they verse number 19, and when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd. So they show up, they've done everything that God's asked them to do. Now they show up and they can't get in. This is the place where after you've done everything that you know to do right. This is the place where after you've taken that massive step that took you everything that you had to do the right thing to make that phone call and try and reconcile the relationship. When you begin to change your priorities financially, when you begin to speak kindly and believe the best about your spouse, when you show up at work with a different attitude, this is you turning your heart back to the Lord and saying, Lord, I don't have all the answers, but I, I want to believe again. All of a sudden, you, you've taken that first difficult step thinking that this, this has got to be the breakthrough. And then all of a sudden you find yourself in a place where you can't get in to the very place where Jesus is that you want to be because there's still some barriers. This is oftentimes where we've taken the first step towards breakthrough, but we come up against an even more difficult obstacle that seems like a breakdown. A breakdown in our faith. This is where it's tempting to say, all right, I give up. I tried. I can tell you I've had that, I've had that moment, I've had those moments many times in my life where it's like, done the thing that I thought was right and then it didn't work out. Reached out, had a conversation with somebody, you humble yourself, you're just like, man, I'm so sorry for where things are at, it was my fault, and you humble yourself, you do the right thing, and then they look at you and say, yeah, it is your fault, and I don't care what you say, and I don't wanna have anything to do with you, and you're just like, wait, whoa, 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 where'd this come from? I thought, Jesus, you said this was my breakthrough. And now it feels like a breakdown. Lord, I prayed a hundred times for an answer. I prayed a hundred times and believed, and it took everything I had to, in this moment, believe you. But now I, I did what I thought was right, and look, it's happening again. If we're not careful, this can be the breakdown of our faith. But I love what his friends and what he does in response to the fact that he can't get in because of the crowds. It says, immediately they climbed up onto the house and began to pull back the tiles off of the roof and lower their friend down into the Jesus. You see, when they came up against the no, instead of their breakdown of their faith, they actually elevated their thoughts by looking up and not taking no for an answer. Tenacious faith. See, sometimes what we need to do in those moments when our head wants to drop because we've just lost the air out of our lungs and our hope has been sucked out of our soul, in those moments we need to elevate our thoughts. We need to lift up. You know, the Bible says that he is the lifter of our heads. 
What does that mean? It means that sometimes we've got to do what Colossians says, where we've got to put our mind on heavenly things. We've got to begin to think different thoughts than what is natural in that moment. Because in that moment, we just want to be like, I'm just brushing my hands off on that relationship. I'm never going to believe again. I'm not going to try. That church is crazy. That woman's crazy. I'm crazy, and I'm just done. I've had a breakdown. I'm going back to my cot. I'm going back to my life, and that's, it's, I'm, I'm just done. But instead of having that moment of breakdown, they lift up their heads at the roof and said, if we can't go in through the door, then we will go in through the roof. Think about this. Instead of having a breakdown when they're confronted with the inability to get their breakthrough, they climb up on the roof and they break in. It's B and E faith, breaking and entering faith. You have permission as a Christian when you are confronted with an obstacle that stands between you and what God is calling you to do, between you and the promises of God, between you and the change and transition that you know God has called you to. You have permission to break and enter to get to Jesus. Now, caveat, young person, don't go get arrested for breaking into someone's home and then blame it on Pastor Lee. He said, I was in church, it was the only thing I heard, he said I could break and enter. Now I'm talking about breaking and entering beyond barriers. I love that breaking and entering mentality. Because what it says is I'm not taking no for an answer. They climbed up on the roof, guys. Have you ever climbed up a ladder under a roof? That's hard enough by itself, but then carrying a man, a full grown man on a cot, that takes some blood, sweat, and tears, and determination. They get up on top of the roof and they know if I can just get down through this roof, if I can just break into the presence of Jesus, everything I need is there. Everything I need is in his presence. Sometimes we just have to have some tenacious, take no for an answer faith that says, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to get into the presence of Jesus. If it means fighting through some rain to get into the presence of Jesus, if it means getting up early to get into the presence of Jesus, if it means turning off the television to get into the presence of Jesus, if it means putting my phone on airplane mode to get into the presence of Jesus, if it means changing the way that I live my life, changing my circle of influence to get into the presence of Jesus, I'm willing to do it because I believe my breakthrough is found in getting into his presence. If I can get into proximity to the church, changer, my life will change. And so they begin to peel off the tiles. Tenacious, won't take no for an answer faith. I call it creative rebellion against barriers. It reminds me of my son Jared that when we were living in Plainwell, he was about four years old. It was in the month of April. It was one of those really warm weeks in the middle of what still should be winter in Michigan. And I know it was still winter because in the middle of our cul-de-sac, we still had this huge mountain of snow that the plows had piled up there. But it was one of those days, it was a Saturday, it was like 60, maybe 65 degrees or 60 degrees. And, you know, all the kids come out of the house. They've all got cabin fever. So Jared's four years old, and he's running around with the neighbor kids, and he comes into the house on a Saturday, and he says, Dad, Dad, the kids are all going to, the neighbors are going to run through the sprinklers. Can I run through the sprinklers? I'm like, what? You're not, there's no way you're running through this. He wants to put on his swimsuit and go run through the sprinklers. Well, the other kids are doing it. The older kids are doing it. And I'm like, well, you're not doing it. Why? Why, Dad? I said, because you're going to get wet, and then you're going to get cold, and then you're going to get sick. So you're not doing it. But dad, I'm, no, dad bleh, bleh, zip, no. And I thought that was it. He walks outside. He's just kind of slumped over. He's disgruntled. He walks out of the house. Dad, I'm, uh. And about half an hour later, I thought it was over, Jane comes out of the kitchen, she walks up to the front door, we have the screen door open, she's looking out, and she says, Lee, you have to come look at your son. I was watching the Tigers, and I'm like, what? So I walk up to the door, look out, and here's Jared sl slinking back from the neighbors, trying to be all slick about it, but he's in his full snowsuit, hood up, pulled tight, gloves and boots soaking wet. And he sees us through the door. He's just standing there in our driveway. 
because he knows he's busted. I open up the door, I'm like, get in the garage. So I go through the kitchen, go out to the garage, I'm like, son, what are you doing? I told you, you could not run through the sprinklers. He said, no. You said I couldn't get wet and cold because then I'll get sick. <laughs> so what he had done was he took our conversation, he went out into the garage, he put the ladder up against our shelves, climbed up and got the box with his snowsuit and boots out, climbed back down, put it all on, zipped it up, went over to the neighbors, ran through the sprinklers and was thinking he was gonna get back, put it all away, walk in dry and warm. That's creative rebellion. <laughs> I didn't know whether to give him like a, a prize for creative problem solving or to spank him. I chose the latter. I had, I, so I like got a wooden spoon, Myle, Myers 30 Acres, aisle five, took him upstairs. And as I'm paddling his four-year-old behind, I'm just laughing with him. I'm saying that is the most creative thing I've ever seen in my life. Wow, son, you're, you're either, you're either going to end up in prison or take over the world. I don't know which one, but... <laughs> He would not take no for an answer. And what would happen if our faith were that determined instead of just taking no and saying, well, there are crowds gathered, I can't get in, or you know what, I've prayed a thousand times, or I've tried to do this, or I've said the right thing. What would happen if we just had an attitude that says, if I can't go in through the door, then I'll go down through the roof? I'll tell you what, that's when breakthrough begins to happen. That's when our active faith, our faithful obedience will not be denied. And we can begin to pull back the tiles off of the roof and get into the proximity to Jesus. It peeled back the tiles. And those tiles represent a couple different things. You see, the, the tiles that they had to remove and the tiles that you and I have to remove sometimes in order to get in the presence of Jesus aren't these physical terracotta ceramic tiles. They were bigger than that, and they are bigger than that in our lives. He had two main obstacles, and these are, I think the, these two, two sets of tiles are the same tiles that if you and I are gonna be B&E Christians, we're gonna have to peel back these same tiles because they all have to do with our mentalities. The first one is we're going to have to do away with the crowd mentality. You see, the first step, they came to the house and they couldn't get in, it says, because of the crowd. And can I just tell you today that the loudest voice in our lives most of the time is the voice of the crowd. It's what everybody thinks. It's what social media says. It's what group think. It's what culture says. It's the norm, it's the status quo, it's what everybody else is doing. It's the voice of comparison. It's the voice of needing other people's approval, of not wanting to stand out. We care way too much what everybody thinks. We care how many likes we're getting on Facebook or how many followers we're getting on Twitter, how many retweets we get or how many uh, you know, likes we're getting on Instagram. Uh, social media has taken our insecurities to a whole nother level. And I love social media. It's an awesome tool, but it's a terrible slave master. And if we live for the crowd, if we care way more about what everybody collectively thinks, we'll never stand out from the crowd. Don't be surprised if you get what everybody else is getting when you do what everybody else is doing. We need to break out of the pack mentality. We need to, we need to be able to think. We need to, we need to be able to believe. We need to be able to stand. We need to be able to climb the wall over the top of the crowd and actually break through. We're going to have to peel back some tiles of a crowd mentality that does not produce a breakthrough in our lives. Crowd mentalities do not produce breakthroughs. Every inventor who has ever made a massive uh, contribution to our, our, our world and scientifically, whether it be a discovery or an invention, has not stayed in the normal lane that everybody else is thinking in. They think outside of the box. You see, crowd mentalities are safe. But breakthrough happens on the battlefield of risk. It's where faith and active obedience take place. So the first set of tiles you're going to have to peel back is the crowd consensus mentality. The second one is you're going to have to deal with religious reasonings. Look at verse 21. And the scribes and the Pharisees began reasoning, saying, 
Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them and said, why are you reasoning in your hearts? That word reasoning is talking about religious mindsets. And let me just tell you that in Jesus' day, there were two, two uh, polar opposite wings of religious mentalities. And both of these two polar ends still plague believers today, Christians today. One is the Pharisees. They were the ultra-legalistic ones who felt like they needed to be in control of everything. And so they're the ultra-conservatives, legalistic over on this end of things, and they're the ones who are standing there while Jesus is healing this man, and they're hung up on the fact that he's stepping outside of their manual. The, on the other polar extreme are the Sadducees, and they are the ultra-liberals. They're the ones that w- refuse to believe in supernatural things. They don't believe in an afterlife. They don't believe in angels. They don't believe in anything. They just, they love their position because of the political clout and the wealth that comes as a result of that. So you've got one wing over here that doubts the supernatural, and you've got a legalistic bent over here. And both of them make up a religious mindset that Jesus confronts their reasoning. That word reasoning in the original language means to do an internal accounting and a jury deliberation. An accounting is done on a ledger where we put deposits and withdrawals to come to a balance. And we make decisions about what we can receive or purchase based on that process and the balance. A jury deliberates taking all the evidence in and then coming to a conclusion of guilt or innocence. And here's why a religious mindset will keep you back from a breakthrough. Because oftentimes when we're operating out of a religious spirit, we're doing the math about how many good things we've done versus how many bad things we've done. And we only think we can receive a breakthrough or a change or a shift in our life when we have done enough good that outweighs our bad. And if our balance is at the bottom, is in a state of deficit, then we just give up and we find ourselves in a state of spiritual breakthrough debt. On the other side of the equation, in the jury deliberation, a religious spirit will take all of the evidence and will take all of God's promises and all of our experiences and we will make a verdict. We will make a judgment even about God about whether God is good or whether he's not, about whether God is faithful or whether he's not. And we become the judge and the jury, and God is put on trial. That's who was on trial right here. It was Jesus, the Son of God, on trial. And both of those mentalities, religious mindsets, will keep us back from experiencing breakthrough. But a step of faith will always change the situation. What does he say to the man? Rise up, take up your bed, and go home. You see, after his encounter with Jesus, he ends up going home carrying the very thing that carried him on his way there. What would it look like in your life if the thing that right now you feel like is controlling you, the barrier that you can't seem to break through, the mentality that's seeming to dominate your life, the indifference that's just clouding your thoughts and your perception, what would happen if that was no longer a barrier? Can I just tell you, it's not you doing enough good to fill the margin and fill the ledger so that at the bottom it leaves a balance that you think you can cash in to get something from God. At the bottom of God's ledger, there's only one name that really matters. It's the name of Jesus because he paid it in full. You relate to God on the basis of grace through faith. And if you think over here as a jury, you're somehow going to take all of this information and with your intellect and your vast wisdom, you're going to somehow determine whether God is who he said he is or is able to do what he said he could do. We need to put ourselves in a position where we're not judging God, but we're submitting to God and saying, God, you must see some things that I don't see. You must understand some things that I don't understand. I can't fathom all the things that you know. All I know is this, if I just get in the presence of the one. I don't, know, I don't need to know about the what, the why, or the how. I just need to know the who of breakthrough. Would you stand up with me all over this room?
Just one step. That first step. See, when you step over the threshold, you leave one place. You begin a journey in the pursuit of another. Today, I don't know what the place looks like where you're living, where you're thinking. I don't know, I don't know what voices have spoken to you. I don't know what obstacles you're facing. I don't know how many times you've tried. I don't know the process. And can I be honest? I don't know the pain. I, can only, I only know my pain. And guys, if you think Pastor Lee stands up on the stage and wow, his life has been easy and it's all put together and polished up and can I just tell you that it's been pushed through this wall, pushed through this wall. It's been take two steps back, one step forward. It's just like yours. Because I'm not the Lord of the breakthrough, but he is. And what he's been faithful to do in my life, I know he'll be faithful to do in your life. You see, if let me just end with this this morning. If your life makes sense to the world, it's not a stranger thing. If your life adds up and you say, well, of course this and of course that, grew up with money and had a great job and went to school and did everything everybody else does and the trajectory of their life obviously equals that they're gonna end up here. Good or bad, if, if, that's just normal. But you were not created for normal. You were created in Christ Jesus to break impossible barriers. You were created so that your life in and of itself is a miracle, so that when people look at you, they say, this is strange because I know their story. I know where they've been. I know what the odds were. I know what they made. I know what they went through. I know who they were around. I knew what happened. And now they've ended up over here. This doesn't add up to that. And we need to have a margin and a gap in our life where only Jesus could have stepped in and made the impossible possible in our life. Our life needs to be strange. Because it points to the one who strange is normal for. I wanna invite our prayer and ministry team to make their way up to the front, if they would, all across the front. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray and we're gonna close and here's, here's how I'm gonna close today. Many of us are in this room and we've, we've taken that first step before and we've come up against resistance. Or we find ourselves in a place where maybe we don't even wanna try again. Or we don't even know what lies beyond the first step. We need some people in our life. We need to have somebody in our life to speak truth, to speak life over us, to pray for us. And I want you to know that, that Jesus is in this place by his Holy Spirit, and anything's possible. This is the realm of the impossible because the king is here, and wherever the king is, there is the kingdom. And so today, if you need a breakthrough, if you need faith, if you need courage, if you just need someone to stand with you, to believe again, to have faith again, to take that next step again. When I pray and we dismiss, I just want you to come forward and we're just gonna take time and we're just gonna pray. I believe that today can become the tipping point of breakthrough. It can become the tipping point. You move and I believe God will move. Lord, today, meet us in this place. Fill this place with your breakthrough anointing, Lord. Fill this place with you. Where there's pain, let there be healing. Where there's blindness, let there be vision. Where there's dullness, let there be life again. Where we've been beat down, let there be strength again. Where there's been disappointment, let there be hope again. But Lord, today, meet us in this place, Lord of the breakthrough. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.